Thank you again for joining us. We are the College of Arts and Sciences Research on Experiential Education, Cast Real. And um, I would like to begin by showing you our mission statement. We're conducting research on various forms of experiential education with um, many goals. We would like to influence the thinking and practice of others drive innovations that strengthen the outcomes of our students from their engagement in many different forms of experiential education, and we'd like to continue to promote the transfer between in-class and out-of-class learning. That transfer is already there, it's already happening. We would like to formalize it and continue it. So who are we? We're standing a little bit out of order. <laughs> Amanda Parker is heading up our division on quality analysis of reflection on co-op, uh, qualitative analysis of reflection on co-op. I am studying a similar piece of reflection on co-op with a quantitative version. Rebecca Morton is researching students' international experiences. And Sarah has begun to take our research to the next step. She's, she's looking at what is happening at other schools. So just to review, Amanda's research and my research has been going on for about a year, and Rebecca and Sarah's research is new, so we are very much um, in the growing stages. We are taking on new projects. Amanda. So I just want to give you a quick introduction to what the uh, concurrent or the peer mentoring dinners are. I was actually a participant uh, before I began on this research, and it's a wonderful experience for me that had, uh, while I was on my first call, we went out to dinner uh, with a guy, with a facilitator, and a small group of my peers who were all also on their first call experience. And we got to talk about anything and everything surrounding what we were doing on the problems that we were having, things we were learning about ourselves and our jobs. Um, and the assessment that I'm doing uh, is of a qualitative survey that I was given at the end and all of the students that go through this um, experience were given at the end just to get a little insight into um, what they gained from participating in the peer mentoring uh, project. Um, very briefly, I would like to So very briefly, I want to give you an idea of the themes and outcomes of the research that we've been doing. Uh, three main themes emerged from the research. And the first one was this idea of problem solving mainly due to their peers. Some of the groups had an undergraduate or grad student. Others had their um, coordinator facilitating these meetings. Um, but what we found out was that the students were learning from each other, not who the facilitator was. The facilitator definitely helped, but it was their peers that helped them solve problems um, and gave them perspective about their jobs. The second uh, element that emerged is quite distinct from the first because it really focuses on this emotional support and emotional guidance. Uh, many of the students wrote in their responses that they didn't feel like they were going in alone. Um, and that their anxieties and their fears could be eased by knowing that their peers were in the same situation. Uh, finally, a personal transformation. We really did see in these responses that students um, were able to take action by participating in the, <coughs> excuse me, by participating in the peer mentoring project. They realized issues or problems or areas for improvement on their job and were able to take action on that and, and make improvements without waiting until the end of their call experience and it really um, bettered their call experience and helped them think about changes for their next call experience. So that was really exciting to see. And now I will let Maria take it away. So Amanda and I looked at the same group of students. They're all going out to dinner, and they're having a fabulous time because Jim is buying it for them. And um, I know I would order seconds and get it to go, but while we have them trapped there with dinner, 
we, um, we took advantage, basically, and we decided to measure their learning in a quantitative survey that Joe Raylan has developed. So at the beginning of their co-op, ideally at their first dinner gathering, they will fill out a survey, and I'll give you just a few quick um, samples in the next slide, and um, we try to save that data. They move through dinner six months later, and they've gone through their first co-op, their values are full, they've probably gained a little bit of weight, and we test them again. We ask them 15 questions, and they will describe how often they engage in a particular work activity. So, um, for instance, on a scale of one to five, they will say how often they learned about things from collaborating with others. We're hoping to see a change from their very first meeting to six months later at their last meeting. So we've been doing this for about um, three co-op cycles. It's a work in progress. We're trying to expand it. We're trying to formalize it. But so far, we are getting um, positive results. I would say the students aren't complaining necessarily about the survey. And um, I think that as the, as the program grows, we'll be able to grab um, a larger sample at one time. I'm going to give this over to Rebecca Morton. Yeah. Um, so I guess my project started um, after I had returned from a volunteer trip in Tanzania. Um, while I was on Tanzania at my co-op in California, I had stayed in email correspondence with a few people from the lab as sort of a reflection tool. So weekly or whenever I, you know, something came up at work or something like that, I would email them and I use them as friends and peers and mentors to sort of talk through stuff with. So in Tanzania, I had just had six months of email correspondence with them over um, when I was in California on co-op, so I felt really comfortable with them. Um, but when I got back, through, our, through my correspondence, there seemed to be some large discrepancies between my, the beginning of my Tanzania trip and the second half of it. Um, in the beginning, I entered with about 20 other newcomers, so I had the chance to you know, enter this amazing country, be really scared and freaked out, but then see 20 familiar, familiar faces every day. And it just sort of seemed more natural to reflect with them, talk with them after we came home from our you know, different volunteer sites, just talk to each other instead of you know, trying to reach out to Jim, because he was all the way back here in the States and might really not understand fully what's going on. So, um, we, so I really didn't email the lab group that much in the beginning. Um, after three weeks, the program sort of ended in Tanzania after three weeks, but you could stay on for up to 12, and I stayed for five. So after three weeks, um, pretty much most of the people that I got to really know and feel comfortable with went home, and this huge new batch of new newcomers came in, and um, this is where you started to see a little differences. Um, I think I didn't really connect with the new group so much because I didn't really need them as much. I had grown through my reflection with the past group and I felt confident where I was. You know, I was in this new country but I had friends I had friends who were local there and you know I felt comfortable with my volunteer placement. Um, I had sort of become a veteran and you know I could answer questions from the new group instead of going through them with them. Um, so it actually turned out that at the end it sort of reflected more to Jim and these guys because I think it was like I felt comfortable there, so then I could tell them about it more. I was more experienced there. Um, and so I think that sort of concluded that there was more growth in the beginning when I was like really getting in there with these newcomers and reflecting with them. And then at the end, I sort of stabilized. So from this, we wondered, you know, is there a difference when you go on study abroad as an individual or as a group, like in the Dialogue, so the Dialogue of Civilizations program that we have here in Northeastern? Um, so when I got back, we were sort of thinking about uh, all of this, and we decided that maybe we should conduct um, open-ended interview uh, with study abroad and dialogue students. So that's kind of where we are now. We've created a, about a 15 half an hour length interview um, with questions on the relationships that students form when they were abroad. So relationships with other students, whether you know they were local students or students they traveled with, um, with professors. Um, sort of mentors that were on their trip, and the sort of reflection that went on, was it spontaneous, was it planned, um, do you think you reflected with other students more, that kind of thing, and the sort of personal growth that occurred while you were on your trip. And sort of taking it from my experience, I guess our hypothesis in all of this is that because those in groups um, are sort of new together and they're kind of their security blanket, reflection just sort of happens more spontaneously and more unconsciously. Like, 
you don't really think about it, you're just having a conversation with your friend, but at the end of it all, you have this whole new life. And I guess our hypothesis is that because people on groups sort of have that security blanket with them, their level of reflection will be higher, and thus the personal growth and transformation that they might go through is also going to be higher. So that's kind of where we are right now when we're kind of getting IRV approval. So again, it's going a little slowly, but I'm really excited to start interviews. Um, we've had great support from the dialogue professors and um, Don Anderson study abroad to get names and everything. So that's where we are with that. And then I'll see you. As everyone here, I'm sure, already knows, not every school puts as much emphasis on experiential education and learning as our school does. But experiential education is rapidly gaining popularity, and more and more schools are beginning to realize that it's really something worthwhile to learn about and to invest in. So over the past few months, since the beginning of January, I have been researching other schools that have decided to start implementing experiential education and learning into their curriculum. And I've been comparing and contrasting the different ways these schools interpret the concept of experiential education and learning, and uh, as well as the ways in which they introduce experiential education and learning into their communities, their schools, and their students. Um, I've been looking at different schools that are similar in terms of size, big universities together, small colleges together, and location, schools that are smack dab in the middle of the city, versus schools that are in a really rural or suburban setting. And I've been seeing if these factors influence the integration of experiential education and learning. The college and universities that I've been researching have all participated in the Martha's Vineyard Summer Institute. We actually have brochures right over there if you uh, want to know more about it. But basically, the institute is sponsored by Northeastern, and it allows teams from schools all over the world to develop strategies to strengthen their campus's efforts to promote learning outside and inside the traditional classroom. Uh, one particular finding that thus far from my research that I'm really interested in is the theme of community engagement. I found this theme in schools that are smaller and also schools that are usually more in rural or suburban settings. And it really makes sense that these types of schools would emphasize community engagement. A smaller school doesn't, may not have the resources or the connections a larger university does. And a school in a rural or suburban setting doesn't have the privilege like a school like Northeastern does where we can send our students to countless businesses and companies that are within walking distance to do their co-ops there. So it really makes a lot of sense that they want to look right outside their campus and into their community and involve that into their experiential education. Uh, Rhodes College is a school that I've been looking at and it's a really great example of a small school that has decided to emphasize community engagement into their experiential education and learning. Uh, Rhodes College is located in Memphis, and it has a student population of about 1,700 students. Uh, Rhodes College went to Martha's Vineyard Summer Institute a couple summers ago, and the team that they brought up uh, made their plan, and they decided they were going to focus on community engagement, not experiential learning. They thought that experiential learning was broader than community engagement, so they were going to focus on that specific, specific facet and focus on that in their, in their campus. So Rhodes went to Martha's Vineyard, made that plan, went back to their campus, uh, integrated that plan to their campus, and they really had a lot of success at it. And that success did not go unrecognized. They were actually featured in the AACNU 2008 newsletter, and they were highlighted as, school, as a school that had a remarkable culture of service and community-based scholarship. So it was really interesting to see that plan Rhodes College made at the Martha's Vineyard Summer Institute was integrated to their campus, worked out really well, and was highlighted at AACNU. And for the future of my research, I'm really looking forward to continuing uh, to try and discover more patterns and themes in schools that have decided that experiential education is something they really want to start getting into and start integrating. And I hope that my research uh, really helps to understand how the idea of experiential education and learning can really mold to fit a variety of different colleges and universities.